Hello, and welcome to another episode of Into the Issues. I'm your host, Steve Pappas, the editor of the Times Argus and the Rutland Herald. And my guest today is, uh, a, has been a regular here at Forca Media, Rick Winston. Rick, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for the invitation, Steve. Um, I, so you and I have known each other um, mostly over email for several years because you do a regular puzzle for the Times Argus and Rutland Herald's weekend edition. Yeah, that's right. That's, and, that's been happening now uh, into its 13th year, 12 oh, a month. Yeah. It has been 13 years? Yeah. And I'm still running into people I have no idea that it's there. Really? Even, even who read the Argus regularly. So huh. I don't know. Well, <laughs> um, well we appreciate it because um, uh, the, the puzzles may be the one thing that uh, all of our readers tend to. Puzzles in the comics are the things I hear about the most. <laughs> yeah. so, um, but we're going to come back to talking about sure. uh, puzzling. I want to uh, take a little trip down memory lane with you because you uh, were a part of a kind of pivotal moment in Montpelier's history, um, if you will, um, mm -hmm. as far as kind of the, the beginning of foundation of commerce in the city that has endured till today. Um, you uh, founded and ran the Savoy Theater for many years, but at mm -hmm. the same time that you were doing that, um, we had Butch Spieler starting up, Bear Pond starting up, Onion River Sports starting up. I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out, but there was a... Horn of the Moon. Horn of the Moon, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and there was kind of a, a, a group of you. It was, you, you know, the, that um, I, I, commerce was always lively in Montpelier. Um, in fact, I miss some of the stores that aren't there anymore, like Gray's, for instance. Hmm. Um, but um, this was the generation of people who either graduated from Goddard and stuck around, or the people who gravitated up here because they knew people who went to Goddard, that I'm falling into that category. Yep. I was already out of college by the time I moved up here. And um, it was kind of the counterculture putting down roots in, um, in Montpelier, not just a back to the land. Um, you know, when I moved up here, uh, the, uh, the kind of the cultural center of music and lectures and art and everything was very much centered in Plainfield around mm. Goddard. And one thing I saw in the 70s was gradually moving into Montpelier. And you'd take a look back after many years and you'd say, oh yeah, I guess I was a part of that. Because <laughs> uh, the precursor to the Savoy was the Lightning Ridge Film Society, yeah, which was every Friday night um, at that uh, pavilion auditorium. So that I did that for eight years before the opportunity came to start the Savoy in the winter of 80-81. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how that came about. Um, you, you, you are known around the area as a film historian. You've had a show here on Orca Media that was about films. Um, where does that come from? Where does your passion for <laughs> celluloid to come from? Uh, well, um, a lot of it is uh, accident of birth. <laughs> <laughs> um, growing up in the uh, suburbs of New York City where there were several independent channels on TV who all filled up their time showing old movies. Mm -hmm. So I got into old movies at a very young age. Um, um, there was a wonderful uh, show that was New York and environs called Million Dollar Movie. And Martin Scorsese credits it with getting him into movies. John Turturro says, that's why I became an actor. Mm. They would have take one movie and show it every night of the week at 7 o'clock. And then two matinees on the weekend. So as Scorsese said, if you were into this show, you became a film critic without even knowing what being a film critic meant. Because mm. <laughs> you liked something, you say, oh, it's 8 o'clock, that scene I really like is coming. Coming around. Uh, coming around. Um, anyway, uh, also, my father was one of these people who 
remembered every movie he ever saw and the circumstances under which he saw it. He could recount plots and, uh, you know, so I, and then I wound up going to school first at Columbia University in New York and then transferred to University of California in Berkeley, two of the best places imaginable to see old movies. Mm -hmm. So, um, by the time I arrived in Vermont and saw that there was nowhere to, <laughs> I got really spoiled seeing a movie any night of the week if I wanted to. Yeah. And that led to starting a film society. Yeah. And how hard was that to do at the time? Well, it actually wasn't hard at all. And um, I, uh, um, I got the idea. Um, and said, hmm, I wonder what would be involved in showing movies. And I think I walked in cold to the newly formed Vermont Council on the Arts. I think they had been around since maybe 68, 69. This would have been 72. And had the good fortune to meet Ellen McCulloch Lovell, who's still around. Yeah. And uh, she said, well, let's see. Uh, there's this wonderful pavilion auditorium that's got 200 seats, but you need a state sponsor to do that. Well, we can be the sponsor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then I knew um, the one-man film department at Goddard at the time was Walter Unger. And he said, well, here are my film catalogs, and uh, this is how I order films, and this is what you have to do. And it just all fell into place. They were, and then I had to figure out where to borrow projectors and the regional library in Berlin, which doesn't exist anymore, and I uh, forget where the other one was from, but it all came together. Huh. And, and a hit right out of the gate? I mean, A hit right out of the gate. It was clearly something that people were waiting for. Yeah. And, and it's always been independent. You've always kind of had a passion for independent film. Um, yes, uh, at the Film Society, um, I should say the Film Society was a hit out of the gate. Um, the Savoy, <laughs> you know, the first week was a novelty, but that wore off pretty <laughs> pretty quickly. It was it was a, a struggle right out of the gate, I should say. Mm. Um, but at the Film Society, the, uh, I programmed a mix of some indie films, and and this was before the real indie. Movement, movement started. Yeah. So a lot of Hollywood classics and then more recent Hollywood, you know, films that were like 10 years old, foreign films that were just getting into, you could get a 16 millimeter print. So it was some old, some new. And that was the intention of uh, the programming at the Savoy to begin with, mm -hmm. um, that it was going to be the same kind of eclectic mix. It became very clear within five or six months that people wanted to see the new movies. Mm -hmm. And so it qu quickly became a mix of new foreign and new American. And, and then it was, we just happened to coincide with the emergence of people like Spike Lee, Jim Jarmusch, John Sayles, and there was a tremendous appetite for, for those films. Mm -hmm. You also came into it at a time where um, videotapes were starting to yes, compete uh, to a certain degree, yeah, right? That was um, 19, we can sort of date, uh, 1985 is when the first video store opened in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. And that was a real challenge because well, gee, you can put on your own Alfred Hitchcock Festival at home. What do you need to go to a theater for? Right. Um, a few years after that, 1988 it was, um, our friends down in Northampton who ran Pleasant Street Theater, and they had started their own video store next door, Pleasant Street Video, <clears throat> and the owner of the Pleasant Street Theater said, trust me on this one. You will not be in competition with yourself if you open your own video store. People will want to take out videos five nights of the week, but on Saturday night, they want to see the new movie. Mm -hmm. 
And so that that's when we opened Downstairs Video in yep. 1989. Yep. Well, you, we, you walked right into the Segway <laughs> on that one. So, and, yeah. and and that became a pivotal, a very pivotal piece of again Montpelier culture was that they could go to, they could see the blockbusters around the corner. They could come to your theater to see the in, the new independent, new foreign, and you had an amazing collection of videos downstairs. Yeah, we were very proud of that collection. Yeah. My wife, Andrea Sirota, uh, and I put together that uh, collection, and um, and it's still, a, a lot of the heart of that collection is still um, at the Montpelier Senior Center. Mm -hmm. No kidding. If you're a member of the Senior Center uh, or of the Savoy, you, know, you have uh, rental privileges there. Yeah. Um, and at some point, you uh, you did step away from it. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's. Uh, I guess this is what it means to have lived long enough to see historical epics start and end. We saw the beginning of the VHS. You know, if we had opened our VH our video store a year earlier, we would have had to get half VHS and half beta tapes. Mm -hmm. By the time it was time to open, nobody beta was getting was gone. beta. Beta yeah. was gone. Then five years later, the first DVD, and then, and then we watched the whole cycle of then streaming, and uh oh, nobody is renting videos anymore. So yeah. now there are, you know, hardly any video stores left anywhere. Yeah. Um, is there one movie that has had a tremendous influence on you personally? Oh. Or, 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 or let me frame it differently. What was the first movie that had a tremendous influence <laughs> on you? Well, it's funny you should say that because sitting in this room, uh, remembering the show I did with Bill Morancy, uh, our very first show was we uh, each picked two movies that were very uh, crucial in our becoming film buffs ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, Bill picked Forbidden Planet mm -hmm. and uh, The African Queen, which he was the first movie his parents took him to. Uh, and for me, it was uh, Citizen Kane, which I saw every night on that show, Million Dollar Movie, and Rear Window, mm -hmm. which was my first Hitchcock movie. And my parents, in their blessed ignorance, took me to see it when I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I did not have nightmares, as many kids might have, but I, um, I, th I think that really started me on my uh, journey as a film buff. Those are, t those are four great <laughs> movies. Yeah. Yours, your two are among <laughs> my favorites. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you can't have a journalist not say that he doesn't like Citizen Kane. Yes, that's right. Um, and Rear Window is, it does make you wonder what was, what was in those suitcase what was in the suitcase all that time but uh, um, so getting back to again Montpelier at that time and that Montpelier really wanted uh, that that kind of culture it's never it, it it's really been blessed since because it, it it hasn't left I mean you and a lot of the folks who mm -hmm. who brought these things to Montpelier the, the things that became the pillars of the community are still here. The Savoy is still yeah. here. You know, and it's it's always a question whether the institution can outlive the founder. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's during the uh, 90s and into the aughts, periodically uh, I would get together with Fred Wilbur, who owned Bookspieler, and Mike Katzenberg, who owned Bear Pond. Mm -hmm. And we would commiserate about how technology was changing each of our endeavors and how long we could, you know, hold out. And now um, all three places are thriving yeah. with new blood and uh, hopefully far into the future. Yeah. I mean, Bear Pond is, people come a long way to, yeah. to, to and, be uh, a part of that as well. So. Um, of course, Bear Pond at that point was across the street where Down Home is yes. now. Yeah, that was yeah. its original location. Um, and 
so looking ahead to where we're looking to the present, um, and while we can say that there has there have been these institutions that have been here, how do you feel that Montpelier has changed since you started your business here all those years ago, or has mm -hmm. it? Oh, it definitely has changed, and uh, you know you can't. Uh, it's hard to separate out what you would rather not have because it's all part of the... <laughs> right. You know, there were people who came up in the 70s and stayed, and, and then because of those institutions, people started thinking about Montpelier as a place to move to mm -hmm. and raise families, and now... Um, um, you know, it's often I will go to the movies and will not recognize very many people there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whenever I hear about a new restaurant opening, I say, oh, another restaurant? Do we really need another restaurant? Because we were talking before the show about it used to be the stockyard and the lobster pot, and that was about it. <laughs> right. I, get, I arrived here just as the Miss Montpelier Diner was getting torn down. Um, anyway, so I, I, um, I hope Montpelier does not become too trendy. Mm. I, think it and, already, and too, I think it already has. And to, um, you know, we, we used to hear from some of our younger employees that it was really hard to find an affordable place to live, mm -hmm. to rent especially, mm -hmm. so. I think that also um, is still true. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, that's that's something I would I would hope can change. Yeah. Um, so one more quick question about that: Do you think that because of the way that Montpelier is between having the state employees and over the years becoming kind of a destination community, but having that base of of you know a strong base of community here? Do you think that the the businesses that were started at that time, um, your contemporaries all did well because it was Montpelier? Do you think that that model would have worked in other places as well? Oh, that's a good question. There was definitely a, a certain DNA, a certain mix. As you said, state employees had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. The number of Goddard grads who stuck around had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, the backs of the landers, um, and Montpelier's growth as a kind of a white collar community. Um, because I can't imagine it working in Barrie, for example. Yes, well, there's a whole other show for you. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. I, you know, I think it was, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that this was original to Mary Hooper, but she said it to. You know, great places don't happen by accident. Yeah. And, uh, and there is, I see it when I bring, just, just the other day, had people visiting from out of town and walking down. I go, this is a really interesting town. This is, a, look, look at the, the architecture and there are, all the storefronts are full. And you go to some places in Maine or upstate New York that may have, have the same population base as Montpelier, and they are really struggling mm -hmm. in a way that Montpelier is not. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about, I want to switch gears almost entirely, although some of your puzzles have to do with films occasionally. <laughs> um, how, did, how did you, first of all, become interested in puzzles, and secondly, how do you come up with <laughs> these and kind of walk us through that process because these are <laughs> okay. these are not simple puzzles. Um, well I, always, I enjoy doing these, I always enjoy doing crossword puzzles but the these crostic puzzles which are different there's a quote that you have to figure out what the quote is you answer a number of clues and the answers are keyed so you put the letters in the, you know. And uh, it turns out the Greek word for head is crostic. So the head of every answer, if 
from A down to Z, if it goes that far, will spell out the name of the author and the name of the source. Mm -hmm. So there, unlike a crossword puzzle, there are different ways to solve it. You can solve it by figuring out the author and the source. Um, you can get, uh, you can do some guesswork and keep going back and forth from the grid to the clues. A lot easier to show. Maybe I'll, I'll bring in a graphic for them to uh, put up, put while, up. We're, while we're talking. Um, anyway, there was a guy who used to do it in the New York Times um, named Thomas Middleton. I used to subscribe to the Progressive magazine, and they had a couple who were doing it, um, and they are now the couple that have been doing it in the New York Times for the last 20 years, Henry Rathbun and Emily Cox. They are the masters. Uh, and I got to thinking, how does, how does anybody do that? Mm -hmm. It's the same impulse you hear about kids taking apart a radio mm -hmm. and seeing if they can put it back together. Mm -hmm. So I was never electronically inclined, so that never appealed to me. But um, okay, so it's got to be a quote of about approximately 170, 180 letters mm -hmm. in the quote. It's got to be pithy. It's got to stand by itself. And because it has to include the name of the author and the name of the source, um, it's got to include those letters that are in the author's name. Right. So then you go looking for... A quote. Yeah. And uh, I had a, a wonderful editor at the Times Argus who has moved on since, Ruth Hare. Yeah. And uh, we met and she said, mm -hmm. how about if just to make it more accessible, these are on Vermont themes, or by Vermont authors. I said, okay, I'll give that a try. And that kind of coincided with the explosion of authors around <laughs> living yeah. in central Vermont and right. Bur Burlington. And so I have not run out. Yeah. Um, and there's always a new Vermont book. I just saw two at Bear Pond that they're, they're having speakers. Um, so um, they're just a lot of fun to put together. It's great brain exercise, and uh, it's as much of a puzzle to put construct it, together. it yeah. as it is to solve it. Well, so that that seems obvious. Yeah, but what always amuses me is that I'll walk down the street, and and one person will say, "That was really too hard last Sunday." <laughs> I I had to look up, you know. And then 10 minutes later, run into it. That was really so easy. Can't you make them a little harder? <laughs> so That's it, great, actually. Yeah, so it's, it, uh, it has a lot to do with the solvers. Uh, you know, if there are baseball clues in there or movie clues or jazz standards or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, and they are hard. I don't think I've ever finished one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. But part of that is my own impatience. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and I do like crossword puzzles, but um, they, they definitely require me to think a little bit yeah. more. Yeah, I have just a quick funny story. I used a quote from a from a book a friend of mine had written. I won't identify him. The, really, one of the most brilliant people that I know. And uh, I said, I'll, I, I, you know, I made this puzzle. I'll. I'll you know, I said, oh, I can't do those things. They, they, I, you know, I'll give it to my editor. He can do. It. He can do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good so, editor right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I'm gonna. I guess I'm gonna keep doing it as long as there's there's room in there and a and a welcome mat. It's there. <laughs> um, and in your own right, you've written. Your own book that came out recently, Red Scare mm -hmm. on the Green Mountains. Yes. And what was your interest in, you know, kind of what spurred that particular? Well, if you trace it back far enough, um, the, my interest in the McCarthy era and the, or the Red Scare era, depending on how you want to term it, uh, it goes back to my parents who had 
their own difficulties during this era. They mm. were both New York City school teachers. My father lost his job because of his politics, and my mother almost lost hers. It was kind of an accident of timing that she got to keep hers and keep teaching till retirement. So it was something I was always aware that affected my family a lot, and I moved to Vermont not knowing very much about Vermont politics. The, the stereotype is, oh, they're really, they're all Republicans up there. Well, you find out very quickly there are all kinds of shades of the Republican Party in Vermont. And there certainly were in 1970, and it was the uh, end of the Phil Hoff era. Mm -hmm. and Begin the Dean Davis and Act 250, that was the first mm -hmm. year I moved here. Um, so I was kept it in the back of my mind, oh, gee, I wonder what happened here during that time. And then I was fortunate enough to meet two people who um, shared my interest. One was the late Richard Hathaway, who taught for many years at Goddard and Vermont College, and Michael Sherman, who was the uh, the executive director of the Vermont Historical Society. Um, so we, the three of us put on a conference about Vermont and the McCarthy era at the end of uh, 1988. And it just kind of marinated since then. And I said, yeah, maybe after the theater is I'm not doing the theater, I'll go back to that and do some more digging and mm -hmm. see what's there. And, one thing led to another, and uh, there was the book. Yeah, and it's it's great for folks who who haven't read it. You should pick up a copy at Bear Pond Books. Um, <laughs> they have it. it. It really is great. I it, and obviously I look at it from the point of view of not just history, but um, journal journalism plays a key role in the book. Yes. Um, the Rutland Herald, in particular. Yes, uh, and a, a lot of the the, the most striking courageous figures in the book. Uh, Robert Mitchell, who mm -hmm. editor and publisher of the Rutland Herald for many years, and John Drysdale at the White River Valley Herald, yeah. Bernard O'Shea up in Swanton. So that was, that was a real great discovery for me to see how many wonderful independent in, and independent-minded newspapers there were in Vermont at this time. Yeah. Well, just how many newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> um, we only have a few minutes left when you see what's going on in the world today. I want to hide. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and knowing what you know about what can happen and what had happened here, um, it has to be terrifying. Yeah, well, I said in the afterword of, of my book that uh, I first became aware of Vermont as an idea when I was in high school and I read Sinclair Lewis's book, It Can't Happen Here, mm -hmm. which was written in 1935. It took place in Vermont, mm -hmm. and it's about a fascist takeover of the U.S. government. And uh, I think those lessons are clear. Somebody I saw said, you know, democracy is not something that is handed to you. You have to actively fight for it constantly. So I think that's what we're up against these days. It certainly feels that way. Yeah. Well, um, we only have a minute left. Uh, what's next for you? You, you, you've got puzzles. You got, you <laughs> yeah, got, yeah. You got another book. You well, got another. You know, I have. Uh, I, by this time, I have um, enough um, puzzles for a collection strictly on cross sticks that have to do with Vermont history. Yeah. So, we'll see. Maybe. The, maybe. That seems like an excellent yeah, idea. Yeah, but for now, I'm teaching uh, film history at the Montpelier Senior Activity Center. Mm -hmm. That's keeping me busy doing lectures around the state on various film topics. Yeah, so. you, you did a you did a nice one on journalism films at right, the Aldrich. At the, at the Aldrich, yeah. right? Yeah. So, which uh, I know I appreciated. So, yeah. well, Rick Winston, thank you very much for joining us and having this discussion, this trip down memory lane, I guess, <laughs> as it were. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for tu tuning in to another edition of Into the Issues. Until next time, thanks for watching. 15 seconds left. Right on the money.